Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Florence. Okay, so uh, welcome everybody. I hope that everybody is connected now. Um, I'm Mina, my name is Mina. I'm the Councillor for Science and Technology uh, at the French Embassy in the UK. I'm leading what we call the Higher Education Research and Innovation Department, which, which gather uh, roughly 10 people, a team of 10 people. And uh, as she said, Florence, is the attaché for uh, science and uh, university and universities and she's my deputy she especially she is especially in charge of supporting the collaboration in the field of social sciences and humanities as today so just to summarize quickly the uh, main uh, missions of our department are promoting French higher education and student mobility between the UK and France. And Damien Vial, who is a, a part of the team, is especially in charge of this mission. We are also in charge of promoting French research in the UK and supporting Franco-British uh, scientific cooperation. We have two other uh, science attaché who are in charge of science and uh, uh, medical and uh, health um, topics. We are also in charge of developing the debate of ideas, which is, uh, well, mainly on global challenges, of course, um, having together French and British uh, speakers and uh, also people from the, uh, from the, the society. And uh, uh, last but not least, we are also supporting the, develop the development of communities of former international students who have studied in France, the France Alumni Network. Again, Damien is in charge. And French researchers based in the UK, the so-called French Education and Research Network for FIRM. And this is also a, a way to work in close partnership with other European scientific uh, diasporas in the UK. On June 27th, our department, together with the Campus France uh, Agency in Paris, we we'll organize a UK day, and I think we will talk about it a bit later, in Paris to reflect the new context of Franco-British relationships in higher education and research. The day will comprise three thematic sessions, one in agronomy and environment, another one on engineering, and last but not least again, one on the possibilities of cooperation between higher education schools or universities dealing with arts and design in France and in the UK. Uh, more generally, the scientific department is part of the French embassy and used to work with most, if not all, uh, the other department of the embassy. Sorry for the noise. Uh, but we have a special uh, connection with the cultural department of the embassy. And in this regard, I would like to acknowledge the presence. I saw her uh, just before the, uh, the beginning. Uh, acknowledge the presence of our colleague, Isabelle Mancy, who is the cultural attaché, and she's in charge of the art department of the embassy. Uh, this department runs a number of exchange and cooperation programs between France and British artists and cultural institutions. So Isabel will be there to answer your questions and maybe uh, tell you more about the programs she's leading. As an illustration of the close ties between our uh, science and cultural departments, we work together at welcoming talent to the UK, whether they are artists, writers, researchers or students, under the same umbrella the Lumière Initiative, whose opportunities can be seen on our website. And then, of course, I invite you to, to go and have a look. Ahead of the UK Day in Paris, we wanted to offer an initial online preparatory meeting to start the discussion. Therefore, I would like to thank the organizers, the speakers, as well as the attendees from the various French and British institutions who are online with us today. So I wish you fruitful discussions that I will follow, and I leave the floor to Florence. Thank you. Thank you, Mina, for this warm welcome. Uh, I won't be long, but uh, let me add a few introductory remarks. Um, first question, why focus on higher education in art and design? Uh, as uh, we know, the, the cultural and creative industries are a key sector uh, in our economies. Uh, they are at the heart of our uh, influence strategies. But we are also aware of the uh, difficulties faced by the schools and universities, uh, which have been increased by the COVID crisis and the Brexit. As a result, uh, it is crucial to, to draw attention to a sector with strong 
uh, potential for growth and uh, opportunities for cooperation. Uh, that's why over this month of June, uh, we are uh, highlighting this sector through a series of uh, public events. Uh, organized in collaboration with the York Festival of Ideas, the uh, London Design Biennale, the Great Exhibition World Festival, um, and of course, the Institut Francais du Royaume-Uni uh, and Campus France. On the uh, 27th of June, uh, British and, and French participants in the Art and Design uh, Campus France uh, workshop uh, in Paris uh, will share their experiences of cooperation uh, in a new bilateral and European framework. Uh, they will also present initiatives of new pluridisciplinary campuses to uh, encourage the dialogue between arts, humanities, sciences, and innovation. Uh, it will be possible to make appointments with counterparts uh, in other uh, uh, institutions. I think the official uh, regist registrations are now closed, but uh, I was said uh, it was still possible to consider uh, exceptions. So uh, you, you will find the, the link to the program uh, in the chat and the contacts with my colleagues in charge of this event, uh, Damien Vial and Sarah Majour. So ahead uh, uh, of this event in Paris, we are meeting today to gain a better understanding of how higher education in art and design is structured on both sides of the channel. And uh, we will also give you uh, key information on the new mobility procedures between uh, the two countries. We believe these elements uh, will facilitate the context between you uh, for further cooperation. So I'll now give the floor to our first two speakers, uh, Marie Chamoreau and uh, Sandra Booth. They will first introduce themselves and their institution. Uh, and then they will present a first panorama of the French and British uh, systems. And uh, afterwards, we will open a discussion, a first discussion with uh, Alice Bruno, uh, David Michael Clark, Paul Haywood to compare the two systems more closely. So, uh, Marie and Sarah, Sandra, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Florence. Uh, so, my name is Marie Chamoreau, and I'm in charge of uh, prom promoting a French art and architecture school at uh, Campus France in Paris uh, since uh, I think now 15 years. I'm also in charge of the Campus Art Platform, which is an application uh, platform for foreign students, international students, uh, wishing to study art, design, music, also architecture, cinema, fashion, uh, all uh, artistic uh, fields. I myself took a competitive examination a long time ago, and I uh, studied at the Beaux Arts Fine, Fine Art School in France. I was then able to continue my study at university, so it's possible to change in France the type of school and study and to continue the study also in university and uh, fine art school. Uh, the landscape of higher education in the arts and architecture in France is vast and diverse. We differentiate between public art and design school, university art school, and pr also private school with uh, specificity with um, uh, what we call the RNCP, uh, Repertoire National des Certifications uh, Professionnelles uh, for the private school. Art school in France are based on the licence, master and doctoral levels and uh, are increasingly open, open to teaching in English. Uh, I don't really know in public school, but uh, I think Alice Bruno is going to um, to, 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 to told us about, uh, about this just uh, after uh, for the teaching in English courses. I won't go into much details about public and art and design school uh, as we are uh, fortunate to have Alice Bruno in this webinar representing all the public art and design school, what we call uh, Beaux Arts Fine Art School over 40 within uh, Andea, uh, Association Nationale des Directeurs d'École d'Art. At Campus France, we are committed to promoting how schools and programs will emphasize the specific features and requirements of these exceptional programs based on the student project mode. I'd like to uh, emphasize the, pro the student projects approach, which is what 
what sets with a type of study apart from other area of university study. It's really different. The campus font website provides them the up-to-date information in several languages, in French, in English, and also in Spanish. So do not hesitate to uh, visit the Campus France website. Our role is not only to provide information and these exceptional programs, but also to help applicants understand the requirement of these specific schools in today's fast changing environment, including training prices. I think we are going to uh, talk about the cost of study in France, uh, which there is a difference between uh, the cost of study in university city and in heart and design public schools. I won't take the floor any longer, so I will hand over to Sandra Booth. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marie, Sandra, and thank, thank you, you, Florence. Um, thank you. Um, thank you, Marie, and thank you, Florence, for um, inviting me to participate. I'm actually move outside because they're having a fire drill, um, but hopefully the connection is OK and you can all hear me. <laughs> um, so, bonjour. Thank you for inviting me to participate in this very important collaboration um, between French and British partners. My name is Sandra Booth and I'm the director for the UK based Council for Higher Education, Art and Design. We usually shorten our name to CHEED. We are the UK equivalent to ONDEA and we act as the sector representative body for UK higher education in art and design. There are some similarities and some differences between CHEED and ONDEA and indeed between the French and UK higher education landscapes. CHEED has 68 institutional members across England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland across the, both the public and the private sector and this includes all the top art and design schools offering foundation courses, undergraduate, postgraduate and doctoral specialisms within arts, media, design and creative education. We also have a research alliance which supports research and knowledge exchange collaborations. We have a subject association alliance which includes NAFE, the National Association for Fine Art Education, and my colleague Paul Haywood is here today, alongside other subject associations such as photography, fashion and textiles, ceramics, moving image and graphic design. CHEED are associate members of ELIA on a European basis and also Cumulus, the Global Association of Design Schools, so our reach is quite far. We have close relations within the UK government and the British Council, but we aren't part of the Ministry of Culture or Education. So as such, we can act as independent brokers and a charitable organisation on behalf of all members. We have over a thousand individual members who are all creative educators, researchers, technicians and practitioners, and they are very keen to participate with our French colleagues. So as a participant in the webinar and campus day, I can act as a bridge between French institutions and potential UK partners within our network. Many of my members are very keen to facilitate staff and student exchanges, visiting professorships and research collaborations, and they have access to schemes and funding to support these activities. CHEED has a website and I'll post the link in the chat and we also have a newsletter um, which I can offer you to use as a way to reach out to all our UK members in order to find the most suitable partner for your future collaborations. So please take a look at the website after the event. I will now just briefly look at the panorama and provide some basics about art and design um, higher education in the UK. Art and design programmes are very popular. They're the third most popular degree programmes following business studies and courses allied to health. And we have nearly 200,000 students enrolling every year. The UK has a unique heritage in art and design and a creative industry that is thriving and is now worth £122 billion to the UK economy. 
One in eight UK businesses are part of the creative industries and the sector provides two million jobs with many art and design graduates employed on a freelance or self-employed basis. We have a very diverse offering of art and design. Um, it's not homogenous. Um, so from conservatoires specializing in classical fine art through to industry focused product design programs in the former polytechnic sector, there are over 1,500 art and design courses on offer in the UK. Students can study at a small and specialist provider or at a large multi-faculty university where the emphasis will be on multidisciplinary practice. Students can take a specialist pathway in a specific discipline or take advantage of the flexible modular format of teaching in the UK, which means students can select the modules they are most passionate about. There's a lot of innovation in course design. For example, at some institutions, you can study creative computing or creative writing alongside your core options. The emphasis is very much on providing a technical vocational experience in art and design, which will also equip students with critical thinking, problem solving, team working, risk taking. And these are skills that are ultimately in demand by the top employers in the creative sector and beyond. Undergraduate degrees are usually three years long and in will, will include a good blend of practical studio practice, historical and analytical perspectives, business elements such as enterprise and entrepreneurship, and insights into the technological side of the art world with access to state-of-the-art studios and facilities. The objective is to give students the creative, technical and management skills that, that will be needed to equip them for success in the creative industries. Many courses have extensive industry and organisational cultural networks and collaborations. So students will be taught by educators, but also industry professionals. They'll work on live briefs and they'll gain insights and portfolio feedback from a wide range of experts. Most students um, will have a broad introductory year and then go on to um, specialise in year two and year three. And the final degree show, which are happening now, they're really an opportunity to collaborate and showcase creative outputs from the courses studied. I'll stop there, um, but hopefully go into more detail during the Q&A session. So thank you very much, and I'll pass you back to you, Florence. Thank you so much, uh, Sandra and, uh, and Marie, for this first uh, overview. Uh, it was uh, already extremely useful, I think, for everybody. Um, but to, to compare uh, the two systems in more uh, detail, uh, I will now ask uh, Alice Bruno, David Michael Clark, and uh, Paul Haywood to join the, the discussion. Uh, I suggest uh, uh, you, you introduce yourself when, when you take the floor. So I will, I will ask you uh, four questions, as you know, and, uh, and uh, you introduce yourself and, and you answer. So um, here is the first question. And then afterwards, we will open the uh, Q&A, of course, on this first part of the, of, of, the, of the meeting. So here is the first question for Alice and uh, Sandra. Um, what would you get from an art and design program of studies? And what are the uh, diplomas delivered in France and in the UK? So I go back to very uh, basic questions and aspects. So hi, I'm um, so I'm Alice Bruno. I'm uh, part of Andea, that is the National Association, not of director of high school, Marie, but of the art school of all the community. And so it's a network of uh, 25 uh, French institutions of higher education and research in art and design under the ages of the Ministry of Culture, so only public sector. So it's around 12,000 students over 60 campuses across France, including its overseas territories. So to introduce myself. Um, and hi, everyone. That's, there's a lot of representatives from the French school. So I will be very short. And after, you can also uh, complete. Um, so very briefly um, uh, about the diploma. So the, <clears throat> the, and I'm talking about only because Marie explained there is uh, different uh, institutions who um, 
uh, art will give art related studies. So I'm talking about only the um, higher um, the schools of art and, and design, fine art and design. So the structure is the same, like three years of uh, Diplôme National d'Art. This is a bachelor level degree. In three years, it's uh, 180 ECTC <laughs> to be uh, precise. And then um, for two years, uh, year four and five is the Diplôme National d'Expression Diplôme National Supérieur d'Expression Artistique. This is a master level degree. So they all internationally recognize a national degree certified by the French Ministry of Culture. So under the European credit transfer system since the last 10 years. Okay, thank you, Alice. Um, and to answer the, the same question, um, so the, the core program is a bachelor's degree that usually takes three years in the UK, and that will be accredited by the university, um, but nationally and internationally recognised um, under the credit transfer scheme. It could also include, for example, in film and TV, the students would also take some qualifications related to the trade body skill set so that they have some technical qualifications alongside their degree. Um, for students who start before the bachelor's degree, they may study a one year foundation course, um, which is widely available, sometimes referred to as year zero in the UK higher education system. And a lot of students then go on to top that up onto the full bachelor's degree. And then at postgraduate level, there'll be a one year full time or a two year part time master's programme. Um, huge variety in delivery since COVID um, with some online elements um, having really um, taken off and been embedded. So that's it in a, in a nutshell. And, and to complete also for our UK colleagues, so the, the diplomas um, under three specialities, let's say, like uh, uh, design, art and communication, and with a lot of specialities, as more than 50 specialities and sub um, title of diplomas and every school has their own uh, specialty most of the time according to the uh, territory, to the story, to the um, professor team. So uh, a huge variety of specialities. And I haven't talked also on uh, the postmaster also that are offered in a in, in lot of schools. And some schools also offer PhD along with a university partner and some of it are uh, Two, one year, two years uh, postmaster studies. Uh, thank you so much. So, um, Sandra, uh, talking about the uh, this uh, year zero, which seems to me very specific to the British system, uh, you introduced the the second question, which is the um, the uh, access to studies. So, uh, this is a question for uh, you, Alice, and, and Paul. Um, what uh, qualifications are needed to join um, a trading course in art and design? And uh, what are the uh, average fees? So, um, Alice, maybe you want to start? Yeah, art schools in French are open to everyone, regardless of their high school diploma or educational background. There's also a special procedure to take the entrance exam if um, uh, you don't have uh, the equivalent of a secondary school diploma. Um, and uh, so the, the entrance is on selective uh, competition on first year, and uh, then an equivalence committee the, the next years. And um, of course, uh, there's also in France, there's no uh, class zero, but there's also uh, a larger choice of preliminary studies in preparatory classes, and uh, some of them are offered directly um, in, the, in, the, in the art schools. Um, this is the exam, and uh, the, we say the tuition free is an average of uh, 500 euros a year. This it's a, it's an average. Yeah, and the entrance. Um, so um, there's a procedure now in France with Parcoursup uh, to entrance, and there's also uh, Campus France. Also, it's a way of access um, and, and, and masters. Um, so there's a lot of platforms, but but I think all the team uh, in the UK embassy can really oriented you very well on all that. 
Yeah, Damien, Damien, Damien will introduce his, himself a bit later and, and we'll uh, speak about the parcours super platform. <laughs> um, Paul, you want to add uh, a comment on the French, uh, on the, uh, the British side? Yes, sure. Um, bonjour, uh, I'm, I'm Paul Hayward. Um, Pardonnez-moi, je ne parle pas français. Um, to be perfectly frank, my English isn't very good either, but we'll try. Um, I'm, I'm, um, I'm chair of the National Association for Fine Arts Education in the UK. As Sandra said, we um, we are one of the subject associations that uh, sits alongside and just just uh, below, below Cheed. Um, we are specific to fine art, although increasingly we um, we are extending our conversations to different subject domains and to areas of interdisciplinarity. Um, we're fairly informal as a group, so we our our role is to try and join conversations together and to look at practice as it's um, developing across different sectors of higher education. I'm also the Dean of Art, Performance, Jewelry, Textiles, Materials, Products, Ceramics, Industrial Design at Central St. Martins at the University of the Arts London. And I guess one where I'm going to start with the answer to your question, Florence, is maybe to think about scale. Um, even the question is about access, but um, currently, for example, um, Sandra mentioned our foundation diploma in art and design, the UK foundation diploma in art and design, or as it, in, in some areas it's known as a, a year zero, where it's integrated into a degree program. Um, the awarding body that covers most of the qualifications for that diploma is based at the University of the Arts London, is the University of the Arts awarding body. It has 60,000 students across the UK. So the, there are very, very large numbers of student engagement in this in the subject domains across art, design and performance. And not all students who come into art and design come through a foundation diploma. Uh, increasingly, direct entry is becoming part of a landscape of competitive entry. Um, and I would agree with, I would agree very much uh, with Alice insofar as this is, our mission should be to provide education for all, all those people who find it relevant to them. Uh, and in principle, that is true. Um, but the caveat being that universities set their own entry standards and those entry standards vary enormously. So the, the normal model that I think most universities would recognize is taking st students at the age of 18 and 19. So students who have school qualifications uh, or school qualifications plus a foundation diploma um, but actually pretty much every university should have a policy for non-standard entrance uh, and that means that there would be opportunities for people who don't come with qualification particularly qualifications that are relevant to the domain and opportunities for students who are either returning to higher education in the career or are just late starters and so we do have quite a healthy uh, practice in some institutions engaging adult learners and adult learners does mean up to 60, 70, 80 years old. It can do, uh, but more more normally would mean people in their 30s and 40s. Um, it varies across the, the country. The, the basis of, of all of this means that we do take a flexible approach to entry. Um, a lot of students are still interviewed, not all, but a lot of students are still interviewed. Uh, most students are expected to submit a portfolio of evidence that relates to their um, to their background in um, experiences and to their uh, the appropriateness of those experiences to be able to adapt to learning and to uh, develop new skills. Um, I think one of the things that's quite important in the UK context because of the disruptions that have been caused by Brexit and quite frankly, by an antagonistic government, uh, right-wing governments are notoriously um, guilty of um, spurning uh, opportunities for inclusive practice. And this is no exception. They're quite, they're quite determined to, um, to, to make this a more exclusive activity for people. Um, but it is important that we as a, as a, as a sort of sector community have um, started to move our thinking towards competencies and competency frameworks. The recognition that art, design, performance, the creative industries and the practice sets with the create the creative in, uh, industries create learning which is transferable, create transferable skills um, which are life transforming and open opportunities up in other sectors. And I, I think that's quite important 
to sort of comment on because actually the numbers involved in art and design education are huge in the UK and of course not everybody is going to qualify with a degree and become a full-time artist that would be ludicrous to suggest but it is um, it is an area of study which is increases people's employment opportunities and makes them more agile um, within the employment market. Um, I guess if you're going to ask me about fees, uh, that's where I'm going to get very embarrassed because um, the fee structure in the UK is bro prohibitive. Um, home students, students who are, who are based as residents in the UK, they, um, they get they, their fees £9,250 per year. Um, and of course, some of that could be cut in most cases that's covered by a student loan, but that student loan does carry um, uh, um, interest when they come to repay. So it's quite a it's quite a large debt that those students are going to uh, find themselves facing uh, when they progress to postgraduate learning. It can vary. Ten thousand five hundred is sort of normal for a home student. Um, unfortunately, because of bloody Brexit, um, European students are now seen as overseas students on the main um, and so the fee does vary quite a bit but overseas students generally speaking might be expected to pay 20, 21, 22, 23,000 pounds per year um, and at, when it gets to postgraduate level at places like the Royal College of Art it gets much higher than that. Um, so that complicates things for us a little bit because of course we as a, as a sector we're very conscious of the cost um, of that commitment and therefore we are actively thinking about new modes of delivery that would enable more students and give more people life opportunity but we've got to be very careful that in doing that we don't undermine the very subject domains that we're trying to preserve. Uh, I'm not sure we have time to, to speak about it, but they, there might be uh, scholarships to compensate these, uh, these fees. Uh, are they accessible to foreign students, um, European students? Maybe we'll talk about yeah. that with Adamian. But yeah, you know. just to be very brief, and it, it would be one of those conversations to take in more detail, but it does vary per institution. And then San, uh, to be honest, Sandra probably knows more about this than I do, but increasingly universities are dependent on, on bequests and uh, dependent on patronage for those scholarships. I know that at the University of the Arts London, we are, we are embarking on quite a lot of work at the moment to create new areas of scholarship and bursary, not just for home students, for international students as well. We have been guilty in the past as a country of giving preferential treatment to our home students and hopefully we will move away from that position. And certainly some of the things that are worth talking about when we get to the agenda on mobility are some of the new innovations that we, we're aware of on a global level that perhaps are moving more towards mutuality. Thank you so much. Um, I, may, maybe we, we, we'll move to the third question, which is very ambitious, and I'm sure we can't answer it today, but let's try at least for two minutes and let's be very schematic. But uh, uh, it relates to um, the articulation between pedagogy and research. Um, um, what does what what role does research play in the in the departments uh, and in the department dynamics? We, we, what is the articulation between pedagogy and, and research? And maybe to simplify the question, we could start with a, a kind of a, a portrait or profile uh, profile tip of, of a teacher in a, in these departments. Uh, are they professionals, academics, uh, researchers, all of that? So. I don't know if you can answer my question, but uh, I'm very curious. <laughs> and, and this is to, to David and, and Paul, actually. And this is a question for you, Paul and David. Paul, David, okay, you want to, to, do, to introduce yourself? Hello, yes. Um, my name's uh, David Michael Clark. Uh, I'm English, half kind of English, half uh, from Hong Kong. But I studied in Glasgow, and uh, afterwards I... Um, after my studies, I did an exchange uh, with, with young artists to come to France. Uh, so I was came to Nantes, and uh, to cut the long story short, I didn't go back, and I and I and I started teaching in an art school in Le Mans, and uh, I'm still teaching there now, 20 years on, and uh, I am part of the board of directors of Ondia. So I'm kind of a 
very involved in how art education is being developed in France now. Um, I would say that uh, the troisième uh, cycle, the 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 idea of a post masters and uh, and doctorates in France is is an area that's still being developed. It, it exists in some art schools, but not all yet. Um, but it's it's being developed in all, all schools. So, like for example, in my school, there are uh, artists, there are professionals like architects, there are people from uh, social sciences, anthropologists, sociologists, some people like that working in the school, uh, developing research. And this is feeding down uh, right to the, the first and second years of studies. For example, in my school, we're developing a big uh, area of research about sound design and uh, and uh, to, to, to build the, that kind of culture in the school, the students uh, in first year are already having history of music lessons, uh, course, you know, lectures about history of music. And I don't know of any other art schools in France that that's happening in. So, and I think each art school, when they decide on, on their, their research project for the third cycle, it's, it filters down throughout uh, the masters and the license uh, level. So, so it's kind of, you have to really, if you really want to find out what the kind of flavor of each art school is, you have to kind of look at what, where that's happening and, and just imagine that that's all, it, it all filters through because very differently to my experience of Britain is that here in France, the teachers tend to work across all levels. Like I teach from first year to fifth year in, in my school and uh, so, so that culture is really present. Whereas when I was in Glasgow, the, the teachers who did the, the bachelors, it was one group and the teachers who did the masters was an, another group. So there could be some, some big separations there, but it tends to be more, more of a kind of a fluidity, I would say, in France. Thank you, David. Uh, Paul, uh, my colleagues from the uh, Control uh, Service Department organized a meeting uh, recently on um, new critical pedagogies in the UK. Um, could you tell us a bit more about it and, and maybe, yeah, try to answer my question very quickly? <laughs> yeah, I'm, to be honest, the, it's interesting you should bring that up. We, we are desperately, in most cases across all institutions, the practitioners on the ground, the people who are teaching, and I need to make a distinction there because our organizations are becoming more heavily institutionalized. You know, they are becoming more bureaucratic and that possibly is to do with the way that the sector is developing at policy level. But nonetheless, it does create some challenges. And so I, if I just talk about the, the our colleagues as practitioners, you'll know that I'm talking about the people who teach. And for them, critical ped pedagogies is, no, is more than just about sharing their approach to teaching and learning. It's also about addressing key themes to, around inclusivity, around um, the decolonization of our curriculum, or at least an, an ability to stop colonizing knowledge. Um, and, then, and, and then some of the more critical global challenges that I think you initially talked about, Florence. So, um, and then how do we treat teaching and learning or the pedagogy of our practice as part of our research landscape? So in other words, we are committed to uh, learning. We're committed to the uh, student-centered learning, primarily across art and design, that's the case. Um, and so the evolution of that, that activity and the evolution of that practice, coming from a background where we did, as a nation, make a very clear decision as part of our history that critical um, and contextual studies, or at least um, theory, would be embedded into the degree structure that actually it, that's what a honours degree means is that there's an embedded component of um, of theory and critical thinking um, and that was a clear decision that was made decades ago so here we are some decades on and still trying to balance those demands on the student and trying to understand how they interact and how they enable learners to progress in whatever way they're going to progress so to get back to your question I think the big challenge for us at the moment is to perhaps move away from the word research and really sort of own practice as a word. Um, because if you look across the higher education, the notion of research is most problematic when it comes to art design and performance. And I've yet to understand why that's the case. But if, so if I'm a midwife, I will quite happily talk about research 
as practice or practice as research, that would be normal. If I'm in the built environment, I would quite happily adopt an approach to research that includes practice. If I'm working um, in any area of legal, I would, again, quite happily adopt the word practice or research in equal measure. And yet in our sector, um, practice is sort of overlooked. Now, I know that's a European problem as well. How do, you, how do we em embrace practice and the problems that practitioners encounter and give that status as research? And that's where we are at the moment. So we have increasingly moved towards um, a mixed economy in relation to uh, teaching and learning, research and knowledge exchange, the knowledge exchange being, if you like, community engagement and business enterprise. And those three those three areas of our job are held in balance. Um, but I suppose our, our in, whilst that's something that is um, inevitably frames the way that we relate to students and the way that students understand knowledge and understand the way that knowledge grows, it's also important that in the process of moving to a more, that, that balanced uh, approach, we are conscious that practitioners are already researchers and practitioners are already working in knowledge exchange. And that actually what we have to worry about is the notion of teaching only. So one of the policy debates at a national level uh, has in the past been around contracts for teachers, which would be teaching only. So you asked about how do we value our teachers? We tend to value them as academics or as technicians or as demonstrators or as studio technicians or as graduate teaching uh, assistants. They're all working in different ways and they're all working at different levels. I, I think our, as, as, a, as a community of art and design academics, we would, we would hope that every one of them is valued for their practice and that that practice is seen as research. Uh, can I just sort of, in France, uh, it's a little bit different. Um, a French teacher at an art school, a superior level art school like me, who works uh, from a bachelor's and master's courses, uh, I will only be teaching 16 hours of courses a week. So that is more or less regrouped on two days. And so I have three days. Well, I would say in the three, my three spare days, one day is always taken up with administration. But I have two days where I where I am a practitioner making my own work. Um, uh, it's not formally named as research yet. We don't have a, a, a statue as of an artist, researcher, teacher kind of thing. There's a there's a there's a movement uh, in uh, uh, colleagues to to try and create a proper statue uh, for a teacher researcher. But uh, we are still, I think, compared to my friends, colleagues in Britain, very, very lucky to have this time to make our own work. Thank you, uh, David and Paul. I will save my fourth question uh, for the second part of, of the meeting because it's linked to the question from, of mobility. But maybe we can open a, a discussion, a Q&A right now, uh, because I'm sure that uh, all we have heard has already uh, stimulated uh, you know, questions and and um, I think so. Maybe the best way to do it would be to uh, lever la main <laughs> if you uh, if you wish to uh, to make a comment or or ask a question to our speakers. Is there any anyone wants to to add anything or is it all very clear enough? To move on to the second part and it was a lot of information also to process i think for everyone but there's one question <laughs> ah mina mina has a question um i have a question maybe uh florence you plan to ask it but i don't know if it's a good time to ask but it comes to my 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 mind um that in france at least well of course i know the uh, french system better than the british one on this uh, uh this aspect of of, of uh, um, targeted uh, school like yours uh, i was wondering if you feel any change for some of the schools who joined bigger groups, universities, or who are department or parts of uh, bigger structures. Does it change something or is it still on the way? Uh, and is there any uh, similar experience in the UK? Or maybe you have 
done it. I mean, this type of not merging, but grouping, uh, maybe it's already exist in the UK, I don't know. So it's mainly to, to, to know whether or not these big movement we had in France, which took time and energy, has some hopefully positive consequences on your, on your schools and uh, activities. Yeah, I don't know. So, uh, uh, Sandra, I'll, I'll maybe I'll, I'll start a little bit. So we, we our, we, we, st well, we still sort of have a, a very strong awareness of our history insofar as art and design education began in at a municipal level in the 1800s, in the mid 1800s, as part of an effort towards innovation. Um, so obviously we had a, a very big empire at the time as a country, and that empire was beginning to strain a little bit in terms of its productivity and its competitive advantage. The, the technical colleges, as they were called, or the colleges of aesthetic science that sprang up around the country were there to deliver competitive advantage in terms of creative innovations to directly to industry. And we're still aware of that because actually our art schools are, are distributed right across the country. And in the 60s, when actually uh, we moved from, if you like, a diploma um, position where we had, it was basically a technical diploma, and we moved to an academic position, that was where we started to integrate research into the teaching and learning. Um, that was the moment when that triggered a move towards universities. And so a lot of our art schools now find themselves at the heart of comprehensive universities, sometimes not quite at the heart, sometimes a little bit sort of marginalized within that system. But yeah, a lot of our art schools find themselves within comprehensive universities. My own university um, is an amalgamation of, of um, specialist art schools. So London College of Communication, Chelsea, Camberwell, Wimbledon, Central St. Martins are the two colleges that were Central St. Martins, London College of Fashion, they were all very well known, very well respected specialist arts institutions. So we end up in, in London with, I think probably by now, the largest specialist art design university possibly in Europe. Um, and that, to give you a flavor of that, in the course, in my course for our fine arts at Central St. Martins, there are over 600 students. There's a similar number at Camberwell. So within one university, we've got 1,200 fine art students, which is a lot. Now, to get to your question, um, what's been the implication and impact of moving into the university sector? As somebody who came from that environment, um, I think there are challenges either way. So I thoroughly enjoyed um, being located inside a university, a comprehensive university, insofar as it enabled both our staff and our students to build relationships with the built environment, the social sciences, the health professions, and that actually in relation to future aspiration for the students, that was quite meaningful. Um, it was also useful that that, 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 that that university, I'm thinking the one I'm thinking of particularly, was also a civic university, a university that felt its sense of belonging within a place and a location. And I know that's the case for a lot of the art schools in France as well, that your location and your relationship with the municipality is really key to your identity as an institution. So that's that, and there's lots of benefits to that, but there's also lots of pressure around budgets and around assimilation into different ways of practicing and assimilation into different into what feel like alien um, pedagog pedagogic practices. And um, so you're always having to compete with other disciplines that don't behave the same way. If you move though into the specialist art and design institution, Yes, we've got a certain amount of liberty to, because we're specialists, but actually I think there's also, we're missing those little bits about growth, about now, now for example, Central St. Martins is desperate now to think about the wider partnerships that are possible for us going beyond our di disciplines and our domains. Um, and we started to do something about that. And I think the wider university in London is also, you know, that there, are, there are examples in, in the LCC where Tom is, there are examples at Chelsea, Camwell and Wimbledon. So I think we, we are reaching out beyond our own territories and our own borders, and we're actively doing it at definitely a level of academic level, uh, but also institutionally. But I still wonder whether actually we 
possibly need a version of ourselves which isn't so focused on the university campus. I think we need that. We need to go back a little bit towards a more agile approach and one that is more integrated into the civic environment. I would just add very briefly um, to support Paul's very comprehensive answer there um, that the some of the benefits that we hear from our members, apologies, <laughs> it's a siren going past, um, who are part of a bigger, more diverse, multi-faculty university is that it's the art and design staff that are leading on most of these agendas. The civic, the civic agenda, the pedagogic practice, um, alternative forms of assessment. So they're leading their colleagues in new thinking um, in critical and creative um, pedagogies. One of the things we do as part of our leadership development program for creative educators is to help them step up to that next level and think beyond their discipline, how their discipline can be applied to the schools of engineering, health, exactly. how mm -hmm. leaders can be developed to sit at the top table within a university. Um, so we give them a lot of support with strategy, change management, financial management, so that they can be the, the leaders um, of those universities and not be taken over by other disciplines. Uh, uh, may I, Florence? Uh, add Just, yeah, a quick remark and then okay. we, the second part. Yeah, of the quick remark. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 the sense of my, my question was something that you, you slightly uh, mentioned here is being in maybe a bigger structure uh, will uh, favor the interfacing with other disciplines. And you mentioned design, engineering, applied math or whatever. So there is kind of synergies that can happen there. And that's why I, 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 I had in mind that it could be uh, beneficial for, for you. That, that's what my, I wanted to comment on. But that makes me think also, we haven't uh, talked about scale of the art school in France. Um, and because you mentioned Sandra, like that the diversity of format, uh, the art and design school in France have quite small format. Um, they're between uh, the smallest one have 60 students total, and the biggest one, perhaps you will, uh, um, I think it's 600, 700 max, and several sites. Um, so they're small, uh, small scale, and some have um, different sites, different campuses, and different uh, cities. Uh, some um, also another format for, uh, are including with the art center, uh, like in Montpellier, um, or in Saint Etienne with the design center. So more linked to the professional sector than the academic sector, and um, some are really connected with the university, uh, but for. Um, so there's a lot of format and um, and every format also linked it to history and territory and local policies and but yeah there's a big diversity of format on that to to be developed and developed and then Florence I give you the, the floor for the second part yeah so let's let's thank you Alisa and let's open the second part of, of the meeting um, we we promised uh, to 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 give uh, key information. Uh, on the new framework uh, for student mobility. Um, I just say, uh, yeah, I, I leave the floor to, to Damien, uh, but uh, previously I want to ask you a very pragmat pragmatic question, um, maybe Sarah and, and, and uh, Sandra and, and David. Um, what would be the best year and the best semester in the curriculum for mobility? Um, so, very quick uh, question and, and answer, and then. Uh, We'll listen to Damien. I, I can give a very quick answer on that because there isn't a specific answer. <laughs> um, there are different things that happen at different times of the, the year. Um, and it would be down to kind of working out the really best option with, with one of your partners. Um, there's broad-based activities that happen in the first year. The final year and the last semester is very much about the assessment and the degree show. Um, it, it's a good idea in collaborating to think about the best time to um, exchange so when there might be other cultural activities for example Leeds City of Culture or London Fashion Week or London Design Week so it'd be really good to look at the holistic 
not just the university, but what else is happening in the vicinity at the time and how to maximise upon that. For example, in Dundee next year, it's the 10 year celebration um, of the UNESCO City of Design and the Victoria and Albert Museum North are going to be really involved in educational exchanges and activities. So I said I was going to give a short answer. That was a long answer. I'm sorry. I'll give the floor to somebody else. Uh, yes, yeah, so in France, that's, um, I would say there's virtually no exchanges happening in first year. I think the students just come into our schools and they get to know their teaching teams and their new cities and settle down. Um, we could easily welcome students in the second year of a, of a bachelor course that's in the middle of our license. It's uh, a perfect time that things can happen. We don't have many students uh, leaving our schools on exchange in the second year, but we're perfectly uh, capable of welcoming, welcoming them. And we have a lot of um, technical teaching that happens at that time. It's a, it's a middle year, like for example, in our school, we have a big uh, computational robotic element and so there's a lot of technical modules and that might be very interesting for some students on the, uh, on, on the bachelor level. On the master's level, it tends to happen in the, um, the first year of the master's. That's what we would call our fourth year in France. And um, some schools do that in the first semester. Some schools do that in the second semester. My school does it in the first semester. Um, and, you know, we can we can welcome people easily into that. The, the last semester, I mean, people are really going to be working on their degree, sh their, their degree show works, their final work. So they don't, they, they don't tend to do exchanges in fifth year. But so on the whole, on the whole, it would be the first year of the masters, or we can easily welcome people on the, from the bachelor's courses on, in, in second year. Thank you so much. Um, so Damien, um, you will introduce yourself, your crucial role in our department. You are Mr. Mobility, Monsieur Mobilité. <laughs> uh, and uh, Damien is uh, your contact for any uh, further question on, on this uh, topic. But uh, Damien, would you introduce yourself? Thank, first thank you very much. Uh, questions. <laughs> yes, thank you very much, Florence. Yes, indeed, I'm Damien Vialla, the Higher Education Attaché. Uh, and I arrived in 2021 in order to uh, strengthen the team uh, in charge of uh, student mobility uh, in a context of uh, Brexit and uh, the end of the Erasmus program, and uh, as well. Uh, the need now to have a, 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 a student visa to go to France. Uh, so uh, I am basically here to explain uh, to students how it works uh, to go uh, to study in France and as well to uh, give some advice to French students who are uh, willing to go to the UK to, uh, to do a study period. Thank you, Damien. So I have two questions. The first one is very simple, but not that simple indeed. Uh, what are the new procedures uh, post-Brexit uh, in terms of applications, visas, language requirements, and credit validation? Yes, thank you very much, Florence. Uh, yes, indeed, after Brexit, well, the things that have changed uh, because now the students have to apply for a visa. Uh, to go to France and in the other way for the French students who want to go to the UK to apply as well for the visa. Uh, the duration is different uh, if we are talking about uh, the student mobility. Uh, I explained that. Um, if um, the UK students want to go to, the, to France, um, if they go for more than three uh, months, they will need a visa. In the other way, uh, the French students who go to uh, the UK, the duration is six months. So if they go to the UK for a duration under six months, they will not need a visa. Um, I will more talk about the French procedure because I'm not an expert on the British one. Uh, for the French procedure, we have implemented here a procedure called Etude en France, which is basically the pre cancellar procedure, uh, which means that it's a step before they apply for their visa on another website called France Visa. Uh, so I will ask uh, to my colleague Sarah if she can uh, paste the link to Etude en France uh, in the chat. 
so that you can see what is the platform. This platform can be used in two different ways. The first way is to use this platform as an application platform, which means that the student can apply for a training program in France in Etudes en France. For example, the students who apply for architecture school, uh, they will use the Etudes en France platform and there is a specific calendar. If you're interested, I can, uh, I will be able to ask your question in my email. Uh, but they will uh, apply for this architecture uh, school via uh, Etudes en France. Um, but uh, it's not so simple. Uh, there are other platforms in order to apply for a training program in France. So they can use, for example, Campus France, uh, as Marie Chamorro uh, said before. Uh, but some schools have also their, <clears throat> their own application procedure. So if they are selected outside the Etudes en France platform, then they will go on Etudes en France with their uh, admission and they will create an account on Etudes en France as a second step after being accepted by a school in France. And this platform, Etudes en France, is used as well for uh, credit mobility, for exchange students. So, uh, for example, if a, a British student is accepted in a French art school in the frame of an exchange program, he will use uh, the, the Etude en France platform uh, with uh, the uh, admission letter from uh, the French school. Um, so, this is basically uh, the new procedure that has been implemented since, uh, since Brexit. Uh, Florence, do you want me to uh, give other information or do you have an, a second question? I, I can't hear you. Yes, I, yes, I have a, a second question about the crucial aspect, which is the fundings. What are the, the possibilities? Yes. In this new context. So regarding um, of funding, uh, it will depend again on uh, the type of mobility, if it's a degree mobility or a credit mobility. For a credit mobility, uh, well, the, the UK uh, schools can use, can apply for Turing, uh, Turing funding. So they, they will apply for Turing and uh, the, the difficulty with the Turing scheme is the calendar because uh, based, uh, usually the schools have their results uh, very late in the year. Uh, they have their results around uh, August. So it's kind of difficult for the student to uh, uh, plan their funding uh, to go to France, let's say. On the other way, uh, for the credit mobility, so for exchange students, uh, French schools still uh, can still use uh, part of their Erasmus funding uh, to send their students uh, to the UK. They have the possibility to use 20% of their Erasmus funding uh, to send students to uh, non-Erasmus uh, members countries, uh, if, I, if I can say that. Um, so this is a, a, a one of the possibilities. If we're talking about degree mobility, uh, in the French, uh, here at the French Embassy, we manage some uh, funding scheme. Uh, for example, we, man we manage a funding scheme called Entente Cordiale, which aims at funding uh, students who are going to undertake a, a master's degree in France. Uh, they are grants for six months, uh, and we, are, we manage this, uh, this uh, this scheme with our uh, British partner, uh, the Franco-British Council. Um, we also have funding for research because we talked about research uh, previously and we managed some grants to fund a short stay, short research stay uh, for the British uh, researchers 
in uh, collaboration with CNRS, which is the major uh, uh, research institution uh, in France. Uh, and for uh, French students who, who want to go to the UK for a degree mobility, um, this is more the, the, the work of, uh, of British Council who have uh, uh, some, um, uh, well, they, they have, the British Council have gathered uh, all the funding that are available for EU students in order to, uh, to go to and study uh, in France. So I'm going to, to uh, paste the, the link to the British Council where uh, you will find uh, all the, the funding available. Uh, thank you, Damien. Uh, Paul, you, you wanted to, to add uh, something, maybe? It might be, oh, oops. I've, oh, it's on, yeah. It might be a slight distraction, Florence, but we um, just um, was aiming to say something whilst we're on this theme, because I think we've increasingly found it necessary to try to innovate in relation to the to student experience and intercultural connectivity. So over the last three, four years, we've been um, we've been joining um, an innovation that was led originally by Zurich um, and, and, by, and by now a network of 13 international universities, one of which is the Ecole Nationale Supérieure in, in Paris. Um, and that innovation is focused on trying to build cooperative platforms that would enable intercultural experience and doesn't necessarily mean mobility, physical mobility. So in other words, mobility at home. Um, and that platform, as we've, we've actually made quite a lot of different initiatives, a couple of things that are possibly relevant to this discussion is that it, it is dependent on smaller experiences, not three months or six months, but actually two or three weeks, um, which is easier to fit into the timetable. It tends towards um, a, a, an exchange in, in terms of the students are actively cooperating with one another in a making environment or in a, in a, in a making um, context. Um, we do include exchange of content, so online seminars, workshops, happenings, conversations, to enable the exchange to affect both the, uh, the academics as well as the students. And actually, it's a lot less dependent on funding and scholarships. So what we've got to at the moment, it needs to be scalable. We are still working on how to enable the credit to flow rather than rather than mapping credit or rather than finding ways in which we can build a credit articulation into the scheme. We're trying to find a credit a system of credit flow and transfer based on competencies. Um, but we've actually progressed that work quite a long way. So just to throw that in there, I, I know the conversation here is about about mobility in relation to place, but this was more to sort of raise the prospect of working cooperatively around areas of intercultural learning um, and, and possibly mobility at home so that we, you know, our current obsession is can we get to a larger number of students than the ones who would normally benefit from international mobility. Uh, you, you mentioned a, a platform which included uh, the ENS, but I couldn't hear the word, the the name of the the platform. It's what? called it's called the shared campus. Um, the shared the, campus. Uh, the, yeah, the shared campus. Right. Like I said, it was it was Zurich who originally took the lead on on initiating, um, and yeah, you know, like I've said, by now there are thirteen participating universities. Oh, well, thank you so much. Uh, Florence, um, as I was talking about visa, if I can have a, uh, add a word on uh, the internship visa, because uh, uh, we have a scheme for internship, uh, so British students who want to go to France and have an experience, uh, let's say during summer or, um, or if they have a, a window for that uh, in their studies, they can uh, find uh, um, a company in France and uh, conclude uh, uh, um, an internship convention uh, agreement with uh, this company. 
uh, and uh, there is a specific scheme for, for this kind of uh, experience, which is not the case in the other way from uh, uh, France to the UK, because it's, it, the, the, this internship visa doesn't exist uh, in, the, in the UK uh, uh, rules. Thank you, Damien. Um, I think uh, we won't have time for questions on my right. Yes, and, uh, but, but I think, but Damien, uh, you, you um, wrote your email address or Sarah uh, put, put your email address in, in the chat so you can easily contact Damien for any further information and question. Um, I think, uh, yeah, it's time to, to thank you very much. Uh, maybe Alice would like to. Yeah, sorry, if you can take two minutes more. Um, I have a last question because um, to prepare, you know, all those uh, different meetings, uh, I did a survey within the French schools and there's also some questions that haven't been raised, one like uh, a language level certificate and all that. But one big question I would like uh, to raise is uh, on the post-COVID, post-Brexit, uh, a lot of schools uh, have lost contact uh, with the British Art School. Uh, they don't have answers. You know, there's a kind of flottement. Uh, so perhaps, uh, Paul, Sandra, you here. Uh, what can we do <laughs> uh, to, because it's not only mobility, but also in cooperation, there has been lots of beautiful, uh, huge uh, cooperation project funded by, uh, you know, FEDER Fund, European Fund, Europe Creative, and many others in the past. And um, so it's also like, just because you're here and it, it was really a concern of most of the school, is how to reconnect, as to reconnect as a group, like we do here, but also as each school can uh, reconnect, if you can give some advice. Thank you, Alice. Um, my, my advice would be um, that CHEED um, could be used as a network to help with reconnections. Um, in terms of our membership, it's usually the most senior person in art and design um, is the institutional representative. Um, so I'd be very happy to sort of act as a broker with anybody where they're having some difficulties in re-establishing connections to just explain a little bit um, about that issue. And I, I would very happily draw that to attention of senior staff at UK higher education arts institutions. I Thank mean, you I, so I, much. I, and on the other side also, of course, uh, at Andrea, we have all the contacts if you lose uh, uh, the contact in, in, in the French schools. Paul? I mean, I think uh, it's a very generous suggestion from Sandra, and I think that'd be re really helpful. Um, I've got a feeling that there is a risk, there's a risk aversion across the UK at the moment. It does relate to the shock of Brexit um, and, and the unhappiness that, that Brexit has caused um, because we've become detached um, yet again. Whereas we were, we, you know, I think as a sector, we were all hoping that we were becoming much more cooperative within the international landscape. Um, and I think that has unsettled some people. Um, and I think the risk aversion it probably relates to funding landscapes and not really having a, a sense of awareness about what, what happens next and where we go uh, in the funding environment. So I do think it's about inform it's about awareness about making people more aware and Cheed is doing doing a, an amazing job on that because it's quite difficult to be a national representative body when you don't have direct a direct relationship with government but it's also quite handy that you don't have a, a direct relationship with government um but i mean yes there is a piece of i think there's a piece of awareness raising that's needed um because actually i, th I think it has created a moment of crisis and, and that crisis is made worse by a like I said, by a national government that is outwardly hostile towards art and design education. And that's why also I'm very thankful huh, to Florence, Dami and all the team to the embassy to create that movement and that synergy to reestablish also those connection, let's say, and motivations. Benedicte? Um, yes, um, hello everyone. Uh, I don't know about the French schools, but I uh, the other French schools, but I know that we've started with our partners to sign um, Turing um, agreement. 
and I don't think that it's been broached as subject here. Um, and it's really almost the same as the Erasmus Plus Agreement. It's literally the same formats. Um, and we just signed it, I think, with um, with CSM. So I think, yeah, I, I, I sent one. Um, so like, this is something that the French schools should do if you haven't done already is reach out to the English schools and say, do you have the possibility to sign a Turing scheme agreement? Because like really it, it allows us to keep doing the exchanges without paying the English fees. Um, of course, it doesn't apply as far as I, as far as I'm aware um, to the degree seeking students, obviously. But here, I don't think we are looking at degree seeking students. Um, yeah, Alice asked me if we could uh, continue the conversation. Of course, we can. Until... If, there's, if there's more question, okay. like Benedict raise hands if, in case. Huh? Yeah, yeah, of course. So let's uh, take this time to. But perhaps not, because it was quite uh, intense. And uh, perhaps, Florence, we have other opportunities to meet. Yes, absolutely. Uh, let's keep in touch, uh, and uh, we can we can share the, the list of the participants, of, of course. But we can also meet um, in two weeks, actually, in Paris uh, um, on the twenty seventh of June. So, um, Damien, you can uh, remind us of this, this event, maybe. And 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 I will add that uh, there is also another meeting in uh, at the end of October, if I understand well, because I, I see a few of them, a few uh, already. Uh, Make appointments uh, in Manchester at the end of October. So the the ELIA uh, network uh, will uh, meet. There will be a symposium um, in Manchester. So I think it could be another uh, uh, occasion to to meet again. Maybe to to meet um, all together as well. The, this small group we are creating today. I don't know. Uh, we can think about it. So Damien. Uh, uh, yes, I, I will remind very quickly. Uh, the, uh, the event uh, on the 27th of June. So it will be in, in Paris at the Campus France Agency, uh, starting at nine o'clock in the morning. Uh, so the, the, the morning will be dedicated to uh, this kind of uh, analysis of uh, the situation of uh, Franco-British uh, cooperation. Uh, so, uh, talking about student mobility, the kind of cooperation that uh, exists uh, what is the new framework uh, as we 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 spoke about uh, like uh, the Turing scheme but we will talk about as well the taste uh, scheme from uh, from Wales um, and so we will have several speakers uh, then in the afternoon uh, we will start with uh, uh, well there will be a bilateral meetings uh, between French and British institutions and uh, in parallel, uh, at the beginning of the afternoon, we will have three workshops. One of them will be uh, on art, so to continue the, the discussion. And the two others will be on engineering schools. Uh, and the third one on uh, environmental uh, and agriculture uh, studies. Yes, and the, the roundtable uh, on um, art and design will gather uh, Alice Bruno, uh, Sandra Booth, uh, Marie Chamorro, but also uh, Heidi Jesma from uh, UCL, uh, UCL East, um, Thomas Greenoff uh, from Glasgow School of Art, and uh, Anne-Lise Anne Rosier, uh, who is a director of the Villa Creative in uh, Avignon. Um, so we'll talk about uh, uh, experiences of cooperation in this new framework. Um, we'll talk about new campuses, new, new multidisciplinary uh, campuses, and uh, also uh, about yeah, new European networks. Um, so we'll be very happy to, to see you there. Uh, any last comment, uh, remark, but if not, I will uh, thank you all, especially, of course, Sandra, Alice, Marie, and, and Paul. Um, and uh, let's meet again very soon. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. See you soon. See you. Uh, Paul, thank you so much.